and the surrounding nations for safety, rather than relying on God. Their outward show of religiosity was an insult to God. Isaiah 29 opens with the prophet making a sorrowful declaration upon Jerusalem. Isaiah is using the alias Ariel, which means Lion of God, to predict how God would deal with Jerusalem's disobedience. The holy city would be under siege and in mourning. God will use their enemies to punish their idolatry and self-centeredness, but the message shifts focus to one of hope. God will also handle the enemies who rise against his chosen people. Rejecting these creator. That's Isaiah 29, 13 through 16. Since Judah's leaders chose darkness instead of light, Judah was unable to understand the word of the Lord. The nation was in a drunken stupor. Isaiah 9 and 12. Isaiah warned Judah about their hypocrisy and helped the religious performance. The Lord pronounced spiritual judgment against Judah through Isaiah, saying that their worship of him was misguided. Judah's leaders thought they could outsmart God and live without his wisdom. But Isaiah warned nothing is hidden from God. They would soon be sorry for rejecting the potter who fashioned and created them. Amen. So um, this Sunday school, I wanted to highlight uh, some of the three things uh, that we will be learning today uh, that the Sunday school brings out. So the, um, if you're taking notes, um, the first outline, which is what Deacon just read, was rejecting the creator. Um, the second outline, if you're taking notes, is returning to the covenant. And then the third outline um, if, yeah, we'll be reminding the children of Israel. So um, if you need a moment to stop, pause, rewind that, uh, feel free to do so to make sure that you're putting those in your bullets um, so we can understand what we're learning here today. Um, so um, the beginning, right, we got um, Isaiah speaking a word, declaring a word, and then we got Deacon just teaching us uh, about the people um, rejecting the creator. And how do we reject the creator? I mean, we, we understand what happened in the story, right? I mean, uh, Prophet Isaiah is basically assessing what has happened in Judah. Um, the people have rejected the creator. How do we reject the creator? One of the questions here, it says, why are God's people deceived? Um, I think that's a, a, a good question to ask because even though we're Christians, it doesn't mean that we aren't misguided. It doesn't mean that we don't misinterpret scripture at times. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're perfect. Right. Um, and so there are times um, that God's people, us, can be deceived. Because uh, one thing I don't want us to do as we read and learn Sunday school is look at the Sunday school lesson and think that we're so much better off than the children of Israel. Um, and that we're so different than the children of Israel. God is still God and people are still people. Amen. Right? Amen. Um, so just to answer, I mean, ask that question, and, it, and it's open for discussion for Deacon Caldwell and Mother Carrie, is why are God's people deceived? How, how are we or how can we be deceived? Because we have to think that the enemy, the devil, knows these scriptures too. Matter of fact, he's been around longer than all of us. Um, so... How can how can we be deceived? Tell me that. Give me an example. You got. Give me an example. A whole lot of time we are deceived because we don't study and we don't listen to no no one that that's, that studies. So we we will have to either listen to someone or do some studying ourselves in order not to be be deceived mm -hmm. because there's a whole lot of stuff out there that was is not true. And if you haven't studied, you'll fall for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got something, Mama? Amen. Okay, you got your mic. 
Uh, I agree with Deacon Caldwell, and the lesson also teaches us that a lot of times we think if we do the same thing over and over, then that's equal to having hearts that are passionate for God. And we'll learn later in the lesson how we get into these rituals, and we think that that, that is serving God when, when in reality I'm learning, even from Minister Temple, that a lot of things we do is not about God. It's not in the Bible. It's not, it's not a part of the covenant. They just became rituals that have probably been handed down from generation to generation, and we have fallen into them, and again, we have been deceived. Right, and, and both of you all spoke about two different points of deception, right? Deacon spoke about more so it in the church and being deceived, you know, because you haven't studied your word, you haven't studied your Sunday school, you haven't studied things of that, and then you talked about the more um, life uh, line of deception. And, and both of them um, coincide, they both go hand in hand, um, because especially when you think about Christians, um, I think we talked about this last time, how many pastors in year 2019 on December 31st on a New Year's Eve watch service talked about what God was going to do <laughs> in 2020. I mean, we, we heard so many pastors proclaim, declare something amazing that was going to happen. And 2020 happened. I mean, death came. Uh, and, and not even just... The physical death, but death in your job, death in marriages, uh, spiritual death. People were leaving churches. Churches died out. I mean, death came like never before. We have seen, in some, uh, as, as, correct me if I'm wrong, and even in your generation, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. and, and so how are these pastors, these leaders, who were supposed to have been listening to God's voice, how were they deceived? Maybe that's part of the, rit the ritual for New Year's Eve, mm. is to get up and proclaim everything is going to be great, everything is going to be wonderful. Mm. And a lot of times we are told things that we want to hear mm. and not so much of what we need to hear. Mm. So, and maybe that's part of the ritual for December 31st is to, we should look at the new year being better, but not to the degree that we're, we, we tell each other it's gonna be great, it's gonna be wonderful, it's gonna be fruitful, it's gonna, finances are gonna be great. I think maybe that's part of the ritual. What do you think? Yes, because each year, cares is ups and downs. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be good all the time. All right. But well, you have to depend on the Lord for the, when you're down, that the Lord will lift you up. I like that. I do too. I like that. That's that wisdom. Yes, it is. <laughs> Deacon <laughs> dropping that wisdom for us. No, for real. Um, and I, and I th you both spoke about two good things. You talked about the rituals, which is the next part of the uh, the subject tonight, uh, today. And then you talked about the the wisdom, um, and depending on God more so than depending on the actual December thirty first event. Um, I agree. I agree because as we continue to grow in God, we're learning that our pastors aren't perfect. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important to learn in 2021, um, is to learn that your bishops aren't perfect, is to learn that your pastors aren't perfect, they're human, and they make mistakes as well. Um, I think the issue um, with these people here were that they were not only human and capable of making mistakes, they had the Adam and Eve syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that, verse 15 says, it says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, mm -hmm. and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us? Mm -hmm. Right? right? So if we can recall back in Genesis, mm -hmm. when Adam and Eve did sin, after all of that happened, and, and remember prior to that, they say that they communed with God, uh -huh. right? They, uh -huh. they, they, they had a relationship with God. So then you fast forward, they sin, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then God comes in and they 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 hiding, right? Mm-hmm. They they're hiding because they're like, why is that we're naked? Why why you see me? And God said, Who told you you was naked? Mm-hmm. All right. Right? Amen. That was them trying to conceal, hide something from the Almighty, the all-knowing. He know everything. All right. Everything that's in your heart. So so these children of Israel, I have this Adam and Eve syndrome um, because I believe that when we first sinned, Adam and Eve, when we first sinned, that was a sin that was birthed out of deception and disobedience. All right. Amen. Right. OK. Right. It was this, it was sin birthed out of deception because Satan had told Adam and Eve, oh, not Adam. He told Eve, uh, for, first of all. God had already gave them the commandment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. God had already gave the children of Israel the commandment. He told them what to do. Mm-hmm. So then the enemy comes in and twists what God says through deception. Okay. Just like he did with Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Twists the word, twists things. And so I believe that not only were they deceived like that, but we can be deceived the same way. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. And, you know, a part of this under under that verse, it says the the people believe God does not see, does not know or is unaware of their secret plans, such as seeking protection. And a lot of times we think that God doesn't see me. He doesn't know what I'm doing. And when you think about it, he does. He made me. Mm -hmm. He knows me. Mm -hmm. He was he was the potter. And so he sees and hears and knows each and everything we do and say and think. Yes. Yeah. And you know, a whole lot of times we like to do things in the dark or when it's night <laughs> because we say, well, nobody will see us. But God has an all seen eye. Mm-hmm. So no matter how dark it is, God sees you. Yes, I he does. I may not see you, but the Lord sees you. That's right. That's right. And the lesson says the wicked think God isn't watching us. He has closed his eyes and won't even see what we do. Psalms 10 and 11 says hiding from God is turning of things upside down, which means reversing God's role and man's role. Mm -hmm. And and, and to add to that, like Deacon was just saying, we're, we, we go, we're deceived because if we entertain darkness, uh-huh. right? Because that's okay. what it is, it's evil. If we entertain darkness, we, we are now believing that whatever we can do, God can't see it because we are in the dark. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, granted, you don't literally go through that step-by-step process. Right. You're not saying literally that God can't see it, but we act out in that way, mm-hmm. right? V- objectively, visually, if I'm looking at it as, as a movie, that's how I'm gonna judge the situation. You, you're supposed to be this believer. You're supposed to be the children of Israel listening and obeying to God. However, your actions are telling me that you are believing that the darkness reigns supreme over your God. Hmm. Right? Okay. Because your actions are saying, I'm being led by deception, and I believe that I could depend on this rather than my God. Okay, and that's the turning of things upside down. That's the turning of things, things upside down. down. That's it. Um, so let's move on to the next one. I think we did okay. get on that first outline. All right. So it's now we're going to return to the covenant, right? Okay. Second outline, returning to the covenant. It says the Lord shifts the message to bring hope for the future. Mm-hmm. God delivers the message through Isaiah that he will restore Judah. God reviews his covenant, which promised that if people repented, they would be restored. All right. If you repent, you will be restored. That, I think that's the beauty in one of this, uh, in, in this section in itself, because you have um, in the verses, God is saying that the way that you have been led, your enemies are going to destroy you. Uh-huh. However, I'm going to allow you to reconcile back to me. I'm going to allow you an escape. All right. <laughs> just repent. Just repent. repent. Uh, okay. You guys, yeah, just repent. Mm-hmm. Repent, and everything gonna be all good, right? And so, so it says God reviews His covenant, which promised that if people repented, they would be restored. One another thing that I like about this is that you can bring God's back word to Him. Mm-hmm. It's not that God forgot the word. 
you can bring it back to him. You know, you can bring it back to him. So in this particular instance, you ain't have to bring God's word back to him. He brought it back to them. God reviewed his covenant. Uh-huh. It ain't like he forgot it, but he reviewed his covenant, you know. And, and, and he, he promised that if you repented, they will be restored. So even in your life, if you repent, you will be restored. It said they would see fruitfulness in the land. Uh-huh. The deaf would hear and understand what the Lord says. Uh-huh. The blind will see and have the ability to read. Those who humble themselves will be filled with joy. In contrast, or on the other hand, those who were oppressive, corrupt, and evil will be killed and banished from the land. All right. And it, and it just shows that God is outlining and drawing a line, saying, if you repent, this is this is what's going to happen. If uh, You're going to be restored. But if you continue to be oppressive, you continue to be evil, if you continue to do that, cool. You, you, you're banned from the land. And that's what he was telling to the children of Israel. That you're going to be banned from this land. You won't be able to, to reap the benefits of the land. All right. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, also, in this lesson, that, that deaf and, and, uh, and blind, that's spiritual blind and spiritual deaf. That's yes. not physical. Uh-huh. That's right. Amen. That's right. Um, and so, uh, I'm moving to one of the next questions. How does God demonstrate his mercy, love, and forgiveness? Not only just in this, okay, but to us. How does God demonstrate His mercy? You could talk about that mm-hmm. in itself. You could go ahead. Uh, well, I think there's a scripture that says His mercy is new every day. Every day. So He, and that says to me, He gives me another chance every day to be restored back to Him from maybe what I did yesterday. Mm -hmm. Maybe I did or said something or thought something that wasn't pleasing to him yesterday. And today, he allowed me to see today because of his mercy and his love, and he still gives me another chance to to repent and get it right and get back in good standing with him. Mm -hmm. And then also, I I believe, just to speak about the mercy and how God um, demonstrated the mercy. I mean, one of the answers tells you in itself, but I mean, it's it's very clear about what mercy is. He did not give you what you deserve. Mm-hmm. That's that's it. That's simple. That's right. That's he right. didn't give me. He allowed me to see today. Mm-hmm. That and, and and I think that's the beauty of mercy is that God is merciful, full of it, full mm-hmm. of mercy, mm-hmm. and He doesn't give me what I deserve. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Lord. Because we live in this time now where people like to. Um, 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 act like they don't stink. Okay. They, they, they never take self-accountability. I mean, I see it all the time on Twitter. I see it all the time on Facebook. I mean, I see it all the time. And um, you see it in the comments. And when somebody has murdered somebody, stole something from somebody, um, and even some of the heinous crimes of rape and, 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 and things of that sort, um, you see people in the comments saying, uh, he needs to be killed right now, or I can't wait till he go to jail and they do whatever they do to him in there. And I'm like, but what have you done? Mm-hmm. Amen. That we don't know about. Right. Because what he did or she did, they got caught. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, we do have a justice system here that doesn't automatically uh, 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 terminate people. Right. Because of their transgressions. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) if we had a system that terminated people or gave people to them their due based on their past actions, how would that book look to them? And I believe our God is telling us to stop being so judgmental. Amen. That's right. Amen. Because, because I see your full life on display when you murdered somebody. We, I mean, we 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 see it. When they didn't talk about your childhood, they put you on trial. They do all that stuff. But the people in the comment section, and a lot of times these are Christians. You know who you are. Um, <laughs> you you don't talk about the things. Or we, we don't see what you've done, the lying that you've done. The, 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 the manipulation that you have done, you being lazy or, 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 or some, you might have you murdered somebody. 
and you got away with yours. Right. But now you're on your high horse 20 years later. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. uh, uh, and, I, and I think we have to be careful and mindful of God's mercy toward yes. us. And I don't think we should take it for granted. Not at all. Because no. he doesn't have to let me see tomorrow. Amen. And you, when you were talking about us, us talking about other people's wickedness, it's easier for me to talk about you and yours mm -hmm. than to maybe own up to mine. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to point at somebody else and, and, and you know, go after what they have done, like you have been saying, right. than it is for me to stand up and say, I did this and the other That's right. and ask for forgiveness and repentance and where's our forgiveness of that other person mm -hmm. where's our forgiveness there that's right and a whole lot of time when we talk about what the other person has done we throw in the light of ours off ourselves on that other person <laughs> yes amen uh -huh. deacon that's amen it. no that's right um so now we're going to talk about uh this light on the word uh, mother carrie says i'm excited to talk about is um it's, oh, yes. It's, <laughs> this, this is one of your favorite, favorite, favorite things. Because I'm, I'm in the business, uh, just, just some of you all who don't know me, I'm in the business of uh, learning God and taking the mask off of the things that I've learned throughout my life uh, okay. about God, where somebody said was true. And then when I go study it for myself, and I, <laughs> I learned that God probably didn't say what that person said or talk what that person talked. And so um, this is one, um, one of my favorite uh, parts of teaching and learning about God. Um, and it, the subject title here in this particular, we're still in outline number two, but it's called Empty Rituals. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Empty Rituals. Man, that could be a sermon title by itself. You can preach that. Amen. Amen. You, you, you can preach that all by itself. You oh, could. Yeah. Yes, you could. Empty rituals. So I, I'll talk a little bit. I'll read a little bit about this, and then we're just going gonna, we're gonna to see what God says. All right, so it says, The half-hearted, ritualistic attitude in worship did not end with the Old Testament times. All My right. God. Okay. Performing religious acts that were void of a relationship with God continued throughout the 400 silent years between the testaments in the between the testaments and into the new testaments before we get here <laughs> i don't even want to go to the next paragraph yet All right. because one of the key parts here that it says it says half-hearted ritualistic attitude worship did not end with the old testament times we could put a pin right there and stop. <laughs> we could put a pin. That's why I said earlier, when we're reading the scriptures and we're seeing everything that the children of Israel did, we have to be careful not to get on our high horse. Amen. Right? Amen. Right. If you want a horse, get off. <laughs> get off the horse now. Um, because I believe... Not only is the black church, but a lot of the churches in, in particular, because ain't nobody exempt from this, but I believe a lot of churches are guilty of having, hosting, celebrating empty rituals. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Preacher, you got to talk about and tell me what do you mean by that? Mother Carrie just told us that on December 31st, 2019, when we have our New Year's Eve services, it's possible, it is very possible that they have become ritualistic. Amen. I think, I, I think after studying this lesson and really thinking about rituals, I agree. I mean, it is a time to gather together, okay, and it is a time to... to be thankful that, you know, I'm leaving this year, going into the new year, and God has blessed me to do that. Okay. But then some of the other things that go on in those services, like the promises yep. of the next year. Man. I think those have become rituals because we all want better. We want better. We want better in the next year. And that's understood. But to make some of the promises that are made mm -hmm. maybe have become rituals. 
it, it, it could be. I'm, okay. We're not going to. We no. ain't going <laughs> It could be. I, I totally agree. Also, um, it's just you even think about the word ritual, right? Because mm-hmm. we don't have no clear definition here. But I want us to use our common sense right now. Okay. Because everybody got common sense. You who watching, you got common sense. When we hear the word ritual outside of church, right? Take your church hat off. Uh-huh. Um, think about the things that have become ritual in your life. I'll give you an example. My mama used to clean faithfully on Saturday mornings. That's right. And we used to hear some Anita Baker, some Teddy Pendergrass. <laughs> we used to hear Marvin Gaye. We used to hear it on Saturday mornings. My mama wasn't saved, y'all. Come on, let me, let me, let me put out that disclaimer when I was younger. Um, that's what we heard on Saturday mornings. And it has become ritual in some black households to clean on Saturday mornings with music and breakfast. Because I, I love being waking up with breakfast on Saturday mornings with music, but not the soap suds and cleaning up the bathrooms and the Clorox and the pine saw. You, you can say that, but that's ritualistic. Okay. Right? You do it. It becomes routine. Yes. And so that has spilled over into the church. Okay. It has spilled over into the church so much so that people here and in, in, in here, uh, uh, what, what do we call it? They, they become deceived by the ritual. Okay. The ritual no longer has meaning. The Bible tells us there is a form of godliness, right? Right. The Bible says there's a form of godliness, and, and then people will be denying the power. I believe Paul talks about it somewhere in the New Testament, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And so we, in order to be a student of the gospel, in order to really be one of God's children, you can't just read the scripture and not ask questions. Okay. You can read the scriptures and rehearse. One, rehearse. one of the things I was telling my grandma, my late grandma before she died, we, we oh my God, we used to love having these conversations about the Bible. Especially when we were talking about Romans 5, when it talks about um, um, through this, uh, through faith, um, we, we, we worship God uh, through Jesus. And I can't remember the scripture verbatim, but you know what it's talking about. It's through faith. So one of the things that we talked about was she's like, I study the Bible. I study the Bible. I said, Grandma, studying the word of God is not rehearsing and remembering scriptures. A lot of Christians believe that when you remember a scripture and you can spit it out verbatim, you have studied the word of God. That is not studying the word of God. How do I know this? Because I can go and do something in, 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 in everyday life and try to study it by remembering the language. And they will tell me, you didn't even understand it. Mm-hmm. You didn't understand it. Yes, you repeat it back to me uh, uh, in, in law school what an offer is. An offer is a manifestation of, of um, uh, no, that's acceptance, a manifestation of assent to an agreement. I have agreed. What was a manifestation? Some action that shows that I agree with the language of the contract. Cool. But the manifestation of an assent, that's just repeating the definition. Okay. I can repeat the definition of acceptance, manifestation of assent, but do I understand Mm -hmm. what acceptance is? Right. Mm -hmm. Only way I can understand what acceptance is or the definition of the word is, is by explaining, giving an example of what it means. Right. So Mm -hmm. to understand the form of godliness, we have to ask, what is a form of godliness? How is that synonymous with an empty ritual? (laughs) Because that's what God, that's what Paul was talking about. Prophet Isaiah was talking about it. He prophesied about it. He declared about it with these children here. And then Paul, late years later, hundreds of years later, is talking about the same thing to the New Testament church. Yeah, and here in the lesson, it talks about it. It says, in the Gospels, Jesus quotes Isaiah 29 and 13 to denounce the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And we know how the Pharisees used to do. I'm trying to tell. Okay, Jesus challenges their pretentiousness, ritualistic worship that focuses on what they want rather than what God wants. Mm -hmm. 
I ain't gonna even let y'all hear the conversation that me and Mother Carrie had before this con- <laughs> <laughs> before the video hit on. But that's what we were talking about. Uh-huh. We were talking about focusing on what God desires from us and not what man has deceptively wanted to be at the top of the totem pole right because right. there's some things that the preacher and the pastor cares about and some things that the church cares about and then there's something that god cares about uh-huh. wow amen amen and we have to understand the difference and i believe that a true believer will be able to not only know the difference but discern the difference okay right amen, amen. Go, i mean you can you you discern when somebody is half-hearted Yes. You okay. discern when somebody is not giving it their best. Amen. Okay. We, we, we understand that. So if we understand it as mere humans, I know God see it. Okay. I have a question. Go ahead, mama. Okay. Does this hypocritical attitude continue today? Absolutely. <laughs> if we don't love God and obey him Monday through Saturday... Okay. Is our worship on Sunday a meaningless ritual? I believe so. Mm-hmm. Do I, we go through the motions as if just showing up at church is enough to convince God to give us what we want? I believe so. Okay. It says to be called God's people, loving worship will flow from grateful hearts. We will live obediently, and when the assembly of believers congregates, there will be sincere expression of our relationship with the true and living God when we are real. That's right. That's right. And I would like to add to that, uh, they get asked a question, then, and the question answers yes. Uh, if you go all week long, mm. you don't pray, mm-hmm. don't read the scripture, mm-hmm. Do everything else you want to do because mm-hmm. ungodly. Mm-hmm. Then you come strutting to church Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. You go to the choir. If you go teach Sunday school, you get up Sunday morning and try to study the lesson. Mm-hmm. That, that's a ritual. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. You're not prepared and you're fooling people. We're not fooling God. All right. Amen. Amen. And you know what? Rituals have been passed down from generation to generation. They have. Because there's a lot of things that if we were asked today, Carrie, why do you why do you clean on Saturday? Mm-hmm. Why can't you clean on Thursday? Mm-hmm. And it'd be like, my mother cleaned on Saturday. I'm about to ruffle somebody's feathers with this one. Oh, here we go. <laughs> pray for pray for Minister Temple and pray for me too. I'm about to ruffle some feathers <laughs> with this one. Why has wearing mother's church hats become <laughs> so ritualistic in the black church? I'm gonna talk about it. Because this, to me, we we have to get past that. We have to truly understand God. Why? Why is that the part of the culture in the black church? God never told us to do such things. Well, Well, could it be just because the ladies that wear hats, and I do too, we like them? You can like them, but it shouldn't be ritual. No. And when I wear one, it's not a ritual. It's I got up today and I looked at what I'm wearing and I decided I want to wear a hat today. That's all I've ever looked at it like. I agree with you. Maybe that's a bad example. And forgive okay. me, i give you another one. All right. This is one thing I think I talked to Pastor about. Yeah, I don't know if he remembers. But speaking in tongues is a holy thing. Okay. Right? Right. We can all admit that. Speaking in tongues is a holy thing. Here's the issue. Speaking in tongues should never be a thing in the church, whereas if you don't do it, you are a second-class Christian. No one will ever verbatim say it, but there was a time in the church, whether it's Church of God in Christ, Baptist, Apostolic, whatever you want to call it, that if you did not speak in tongues... You couldn't do too much in the church. Wow, I didn't know I didn't know that. So now I've seen people on YouTube, uh, for, uh, former people who have been, uh, you know, uh, in denominations and what so have you, said they had to fake the funk just to be accepted. So, so I'm saying this: 
there are people who are faking speaking in tongues, <laughs> even in the church. Me personally, I would think you are on dangerous ground. Of course you are. Spiritually, you are on dangerous ground. Of course you are. Because once again, back over here in the left, there we go. God sees and hears, he hears it all. what you're doing. That's right. Hears it all. And so you that, to me, would be pretty dangerous ground. It is, because you can deceive me. Yes. I, you can go up there and you can, you can have practiced your tongue speaking at home. But you're deceiving God also. Exactly. And that's the problem. Yes. You deceive us, but you can't deceive God. Amen. Wow. That would be, I think that would be dangerous. It is, because remember, speaking in tongues is you having a conversation with God. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if you doing it, knowing you lying, <laughs> you ain't having no conversation with God. God knows your empty ritual. Yeah, plus he knows you're not saying anything. He knows you ain't saying nothing. Wow. You're okay. just mumbling. You ain't even in the spirit. It's a form of godliness. Okay. All right. It looks godly, but it isn't. So we're going to move on to the next one because we could talk about this all day. I'm telling you, we, you could preach that. Um, third outline, reminding the children of Israel. It says, God reinforces his message to the children of Israel by reminding them of their forefather, Abraham. Although he chastises the people for their waywardness, God assures them that they will not live in shame and spiritual poverty. God will fulfill his promise to Abraham to be the father of many nations. Okay. It says, if God's chosen people, uh, if God's chosen people return to worship God, they will be able to understand and obey God's commands. God's people need to remember that God has remained faithful to Abraham uh -huh. with the blessings of wealth and progeny. And even those who scoffed at God and who ignored his instruction will change their ways. The thing that baffled me about this was that God said, I'm going to allow your enemies to destroy you. And then... I'm going to allow you to ask for forgiveness, and then I'm going to destroy your enemies who I've allowed to destroy you. Yeah, yeah me too. It, it, I, I thought uh -huh. that's, that's, that's God. That's God. Nobody else could do that but God. Yeah, I will raise them up to destroy you, then I will destroy them from destroying you. That, that's God. That's God. It is, isn't it? Uh, and that's what I love about God, because um, uh, we learn so much about him, and uh, his ways are definitely unorthodox. Um, they're definitely things that we wouldn't normally think of or consider. Um, and so the fact that God said, I'm going to raise up your enemy because of your sin, uh -huh. and I'm going to allow them to prevail over you, but then... I'm going to prevail over your enemy, enemy once you're back in good standing with me. <laughs> that's when you just say, but God. But God. And so that's to anybody else who's listening, right? The outline in itself says to remind the children of Israel, to remind you, you know, the, the children, um, um, Christians, your God's children, that if you have done something and you have been in disobedience, to what God has told you, and you know what God has told you, mm -hmm. and things have happened to you because of your disobedience, God is saying, come back home, and then the things that have happened to you, we're going to turn them around for your good. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're going to turn them around, despite what it looks like. I know the enemy has prevailed. I know that somebody in your life has said something to you, done something to you, whatever. You have been in a sticky situation, whatever. God said, I will pull you out of the sticky situation. Yes, he will. I know you got yourself into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to get you out of it. Amen. Amen. And so um, I think that's, that's um, one of the last things that we talked about, too, is the light on the word, um, which is on page 104, if you have your book, which is God's promise to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, God ordered Abraham to get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. It says, based on this historical fact, Isaiah promises that the house of Jacob will not be ashamed or grow pale because of their enemies. Fear makes, fear makes a face look pale. Uh -huh. <laughs> they will no longer be afraid of other nations. So this promise is repeated three times in Isaiah as a perpetual covenant to God's people. 
but Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. And so I say that to say this to you. God will help you. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Amen, he will. God will help you. God will save you out of whatever you're in. And God will restore you to allow you to prevail. Amen. Yes, he will. The Lord has an everlasting salvation for you. Has an everlasting salvation for your children. Has an everlasting salvation. This plan of redemption is everlasting. Amen. Amen. And, and it's an amazing plan as long as you accept it. As long as you repent and, and get back into God's favor. And you know, and I would like to add here, it said students will embrace God's chastisement. And mm. we should. Mm. We should. It doesn't feel good. Mm. But it says God's love is boundless. And he freely lavishes his grace on those who would receive his love. Amen. God's kindness leads to repentance. Amen. However, he will allow circumstances and experiences to chastise and teach memorable lessons. After chastisement, God lovingly restores. And that's just like a parent. Yeah. When, you're, when we're raising our children, they do something wrong, they have to be chastised, we have to explain to them why you're being chastised, and then at the same time, as soon as it's all over, we hug them, we kiss them, and we let them know we still love you. Yeah. But you can't do wrong. Yep. And, and, and that's the kind of God that we serve. He chastises us, and we should learn from our chastisement. That's, to me, that's the most important thing. Because in my life, it feels like until I learn the lesson, I keep repeating it. That's right. He keeps taking me through it until I finally get what it is that he's trying to tell me. And it's only for my betterment. Deacon Caldwell, did you want to say something on that? Well, I want to say from what I perceive from this lesson is that no matter what you have done if you return to God he will forgive you your, your sins and he will save you amen amen okay that concludes today's lesson we we hope that you got something out of it that you can apply to your life uh, in today's world God's word we know is for yesterday today and forever there's nothing new under the sun amen Amen. Now, we would like to ask you to, to uh, give to our ministry, give to the Sunday school, give to the church, and we have various ways that you can do that. We have the website, ctkojic.org. We have Givelify Christian Tabernacle Church. We have Cash App, the dollar sign, and the tab, C-O-G-I-C. -C. And you can also always give in person when you attend Sunday school. Sunday school right now, we are doing in-person services on the first and third Sundays, and we have also have Sunday school on those Sundays. Make it a family affair. Bring everybody out. Sunday school starts at 11, and it goes from 11 to 11.55. And we would look forward to seeing each and every one of you. At this time, Deacon Caldwell, would you like to pray us out? Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for the lesson today. We hard. We hope that it was somebody will get something from this lesson to change our lives, Father. Amen. Amen. Bless them and keep them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.